You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. If, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a curious person. My name is Gary Arndt, and I'm the host of Everything Everywhere Daily, a daily podcast for curious people just like you. In about 10 minutes, you'll learn about things you didn't even know you didn't know. I cover topics from ancient history, modern history, technology, science, geography, and, well, everything. If you want to broaden your knowledge base and learn something new every day, listen to Everything Everywhere Daily, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Once again, that's Everything Everywhere Daily. If we know anything about the 1920 election, it was this. There was a smoke-filled room, right? And Harding was elected, or he was selected in that room to be the nominee. Here's the issue. There really appears, upon a view of the record, there was no smoke-filled room at all. It's hard to believe, right? Because it's repeated so much. And I know, once again, I have to go back to my old archives. I probably talked about that smoke-filled room. But here's the thing. People were smoking, and they were smoking inside rooms. And there certainly were smoke-filled rooms where people were talking about who to pick, and people were talking about Harding. But there was no one smoke-filled room where the whole thing was decided like that. 1920 was a convention like many other Republican conventions with lots of meetings, lots of votes, lots of movement between delegates and lots of candidates. Harding was not a favorite, but he also was not an unknown. Ohio was a key Republican state that would swing between parties at this time. Wilson wins it in 1916. So it's not this crazy idea to run a senator from Ohio. Oh, guess what else? Who's the keynote speaker? at the 1916 Republican convention. It's Warren G. Harding. He's a candidate from the beginning of the convention. He was a supporter of Taft in the battle between Teddy Roosevelt and Taft in 1912. Harding comes in sixth in the first ballot in Chicago and comes in fifth on the second ballot. See, the whole smoke-filled legend is actually most recorded months before the convention when Harry Doherty is in the Waldorf Astoria and Doherty's kind of Harding's man. He's in the Waldorf Astoria, New York, and he's pestered by a reporter. He says, you know, your candidate's lost momentum. He's not going to be anywhere in the convention. How how can you remain in the race? And Darty says, we don't need to be in the lead. Candidates will bicker. This is what's going to happen. 12 to 15 men will sit around a table in a smoke-filled room and pick the nominee. That story was printed months before the convention in February 1920. It just happens to be partly what happens here, that there's a battle between Frank Loden of Illinois and Leonard Wood, the general associated with the now deceased Theodore Roosevelt. You have in these two, the absolute two representatives of the sides of the party. All right. A Loudon is conservative. Leonard Wood is more progressive. He's associated with Teddy Roosevelt. So it's that same split of 1912, you know, a little bit. There's other candidates as well. Harding's always in the race. He gains a little. On the sixth ballot, it's 311 and a half Loden, 311 and a half Wood, and Harding is still fourth. On the seventh, he's third, and he wins the tenth ballot. That's when an AP reporter with no evidence, largely guessing, and largely wanting to scoop other people, and maybe having read that article months before, says that the nominee was chosen in a smoke-filled room. Here's what Paul Bowler says. There was no smoke-filled room. Had there been one, they would have likely put together a different ticket. The convention was leaderless. What about the meeting in the Blackstone Hotel, room 404, George Harvey? Well, George Harvey was a New Jersey Democrat. And it is true that as an editor of Harper's Magazine, and now he had his own magazine he was starting, Harvey's, he had been instrumental in backing Woodrow Wilson, both in 1908 unsuccessfully and then in 1912 successfully. So that part's true. He was trying to reignite his name and associate himself with this candidate, Harding. And it's true that Harvey had a room in the Blackstone Hotel. It's true that it was 404. It's true that many senators and other people met there and talked about Harding and several other candidates. But here's what everyone insists in the accounts. Everyone left 404 with a different view of who they're going to vote for, free to vote for any candidate. It's also true that Reed Smoot, the senator from Utah, who would be associated with the famous tariff, Smoot-Hawley, in room 404, 
talking with all the other senators, since it's smoot, he's not going to be smoking nor drinking, pushes Harding to everyone in the room. That part's true. And many candidates were being pushed by other senators. It's probably also true that most of the senators liked Harding. They had served with them. But after the meetings in, in that room and others, the next day at the convention, it's not like everyone goes immediately for Harding. There's actually many votes. And there's even an attempt at or a wood loudon combination ticket. And those two teams talk in various rooms. And it's just Loudon decides he doesn't want to be Wood's vice president. And so you go to Harding. In the election campaign, Harding had an issue to run on, and that was normalty. Things were just so crazy and just needed to get back to normal. You know, World War I, strikes, riots, the influenza. We need not heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalty. The speech actually didn't call for him to say normalty. That was a mistake. It called for him to say normality. But Harding said, normalty. But luckily, none of this is on TV. And at that time, while radio was around, none of it was on radio. Helpful reporters just changed it to normalcy. It worked. Using a campaign slogan perfected by newspaper scribblers, he won 60% of the vote. Jackson worked in the West. Van Buren, the New Yorker, the Sage of Albany, the magician, did not. The image was a stuffy little political figure surrounded by piles of money. And when the banks collapsed under his watch as president, an economic panic began, it was real easy to go after him. They created this image, which didn't really exist. Van Buren He's actually a kind of thrifty guy who made limited expenditures in the White House, but running William Henry Harrison, popular in the West, made a lot of sense for the Whigs in 1840. They kind of Jacksoned the Whig party. But a Whig named Charles Ogle goes further in a pamphlet called The Regal Splendor of the President's Palace. He describes a place that doesn't exist. The thrifty Van Buren White House is turned into an absolute royal castle. Double silk window curtains, Saxton carpets, mahogany, gilt eagle adorned French bedstands, golden goblets, gaudy artificial flowers, splendid French china vases, gilt lamps, sumptuous drawing rooms with lavish columns. Those you have, but that's just kind of part of what comes with the White House. Chandeliers and sofas. Is this all not enough? to sicken an old-fashioned Democrat? It might be, but none of it was fact. He spent less than his predecessors in the White House. And in any case, a president at this time spent his own money on the White House. Nonetheless, it was as splendid as that of the Caesars, Ogle's pamphlet says. And in a bad economy, this helped Whigs into the White House. But it's in 1808 where a newspaper finds something that's really gold. Um, just as Jefferson is in the White House and about to hand off to his friend, James Madison, another rumor mill nonsensity comes out. Madison, it is said, is actually a French citizen and not a United States citizen. He's running for president of the United States as a French citizen. The Albany Register points to a resolution by the Revolutionary Assembly in Paris the government of France, transmitted to the bloody Robespierre, who is happy to read it, that made James Madison and Thomas Jefferson naturalized citizens of France. Madison was, Federalist now claimed, a Frenchman. He was always sympathetic, but now we know the truth. Republican papers would handle that charge. It's insanity, one said. An unsolicited resolution does not a citizenship make. Jefferson or Madison would have to appear before the body in France. Also, it turns out it had nothing to do with uh, Robespierre, who was, uh, of course, the most wild and hated uh, in America of all the French revolutionaries. It was the newer government. And by the way, Republicans found out, this same assembly in Paris 
has also made Federalist heroes Washington and Hamilton French citizens. Shall we now call them Frenchmen? If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a curious person. My name is Gary Arndt, and I'm the host of Everything Everywhere Daily, a daily podcast for curious people just like you. In about 10 minutes, you'll learn about things you didn't even know you didn't know. I cover topics from ancient history, modern history, technology, science, geography, and, well, everything. If you want to broaden your knowledge base and learn something new every day, listen to Everything Everywhere Daily, wherever you're listening to this podcast. Once again, that's Everything Everywhere Daily. The Albany Register was forced to admit that the answer was no. But other Federalist papers continued to call Madison the Frenchman in their pages. A lighter attack was seen in 1924 when Pennsylvanian A. Mitchell Palmer, former Attorney, Gen former Attorney General and Democrat, was asked to comment on Coolidge's plans to tour the country. Palmer said, I hope he will. It will be a splendid thing for the Democratic Party. The people would get a chance to see him and learn his limitations. Part of that is just smack talk and Palmer wanting a piece of the stage maybe to get the office that Coolidge now has. But some of it is a hint that Coolidge wasn't a great speaker and didn't say much. That would be attempted to be used again as a challenger, but this time by a challenger in his own party. Wherever I have gone in this country, I have found Americans. That's what Alf Landon candidate in 1936 running against Franklin Roosevelt said, and it led to a lot of chuckles from reporters and others. Alf Landon became the GOP nominee because they really had few others. They didn't want to run Herbert Hoover again. Franklin Roosevelt was having a pretty successful presidency those first four years. But Alf Landon, governor of Kansas, got elected while other Republicans lost. So they ran him for president. He wanted to emphasize his heartland roots. So buttons and posters would have sunflowers because Kansas is the sunflower state. But even that turned against him. Democrats pointed out that sunflowers die in November. Alf Landon would do very well in Vermont. He'd also do well in Maine. It was just the rest of the states that he lost. But here's what Eisenhower said. Things are more like they are now than they ever were before. Thanks, Ike. Reagan once said, We are trying to get unemployment to go up, and I think we are going to succeed. Where George W. Bush said, I know how hard it is for you to put food on your family. I mean, it is, and I suppose that's possible to put food on your family, but it doesn't sound like a good idea. And there's been some great unintended slogans as well. Uh, of all the political statements, I think this one, if I'm president, we're going to drink more. That was Lindsey Graham running in 2016. Um, he was, of course, talking about how he might improve inter-party relations during a stop at the Iowa State Fair. Maybe it could be a slogan. It would certainly have been better than uh, the slogan of the 1884 campaign of Blaine and Logan, where they handed out iron doorstops shaped like a frog, which read, I croak for Blaine and Logan. Or William Howard Taft running as president for re-election. It's nothing but fair to leave Taft in the chair. Or the 1956 slogan of Adelaide Stevenson and Estes Kefauver, which is Adelaide and Estes, the bestest. Thomas Dewey had a great name to play off of. Well, do we or don't we? And we are due for a change. Later it was, do it with Dewey. Rutherford B. Hayes giving advice to James Garfield, who was running for president after him, told him to sit cross-legged and look wise for the duration of the campaign. Maybe Clinton should have followed that advice. Instead, he went out to a group in Dallas, a group of fundraisers, and said, probably there are people in this room that are still mad at me. Because you think I raised your taxes too much. It might surprise you to know, I think I raised them too much. That made some of his Democratic supporters who had voted in Congress for his tax bill quite angry that he was now apologizing for it. 
And of course, Biden once said, one man stands ready to deliver the change we desperately need, a man I'm proud to call my friend, the next president of the United States, Barack America. Well, their opponent in the next election, Mitt Romney, also made slips of the tongue when he introduced his running mate as Paul Ryan, the next president of the United States. Worst is, he had stepped off the podium, had to return to the podium, and make it clear to the audience that, yes, he, Mitt Romney, was running for president. Ryan is going to be veep. Neither got the chance. Giving away government property makes a good campaign slogan if you can get away with it. That's what Abraham Lincoln did in 1860, when the slogan was, vote yourself a farm. Now, it was a promise that was ending up being fulfilled by the Republicans when they passed the Homestead Act. How were votes taken at this time? Well, there were no machines. Those come much later. Very often, live voice votes would be used. So the person who's voting, the voter, would come to the voting area, sometimes a court, and would say their vote to the clerk. And the clerk or the judge would record it. It was changing already at the time of the American Revolution, this system of viva voca voting, you know, live voice voting. As one New Jersey committeeman said, it it was an issue, you know, voting in person, and then sometimes the candidates would be there in the polling place. It openly wounded tender sensibility of friendship. So there are other methods. In some areas, corn and beans would be used, like corn for yay, beans for nay, and then you put it into the jar. That way, we don't know who did what. In Kentucky, they would line up people. You know, they would line up people on one side of a question, line up people on another, and just simply count how many people were on each line, either for a person or for a public question. Most states went to paper, where you would drop in a paper ballot listing the electors into a box. Kentucky kept its voice voting all the way to 1890. But those paper ballots that you would get had a couple of issues. One is, you know, on paper was kind of an expensive commodity up until right before the Civil War. So that was an issue. And then secondly, where did you get the paper, the ballots from? Well, you got them from the people who were running. You got them from the parties. It's in the 1850s. Not in America, but in Australia, where there had been some voter fraud. The the Tasmanian elections particularly were known for various swindles that would go on. And the government there created a new ballot. And that ballot would be provided by the state in very clear printing with all the parties and all the candidates in identical fonts and all available on one ballot. The voter would then mark the ballot, and that's how the vote would be recorded. The act of voting is then secret, and you don't get a ballot until you come to the polling place. This so-called Australian ballot comes to America in the 1880s, and not without trouble. Opponents are very concerned. They call it the kangaroo vote and say, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be complex. Some of these ballots are going to be giant, and voters will be confused. And there's something else. It just takes away what should be an American value. A person going to a polling place in and declaring either by handing a paper ballot or by voice who they're going to vote for. It's just part of being a man. Or some of the sentiments that you see in newspapers attacking the kangaroo vote. Really, there's a lot of Australian ballots in action by the time of the 1892 election. And by the time by the time Taft runs for president in 1908, you have the overwhelming majority of states using the Australian ballot. And it's still the basis of the system that we have today. It comes in many forms. It can now be mailed to you or you have to go. It can be a butterfly ballot. It can be levers. It's still the basis of the type of vote that we have today.